Amen. I love that video. And I'll explain a little bit more why for, for me personally. But uh, grateful to be here this morning. Uh, grateful for all the uh, well wishes uh, to my wife for her birthday and uh, Megan as well. And just uh, grateful that uh, we can be together as a family. And just a point of clarification, uh, the Turkey Bowl is going to be at uh, Desert Breeze Soccer Complex. So some of you guys are going to show up at the park and say, where's the guy? They tricked me. No, we're at the, across the street at the soccer complex. All right. So by show of hands, who's going to be there? Wow. OK, we can at least get one team together. That's awesome. Um, should be fun. But, um, you know, this morning, it's interesting because every year Thanksgiving comes around the same time every year. And it seems like every year I always mess up and do the Thanksgiving sermon after Thanksgiving has taken place. So this year I wanted to repent and actually do it before Thanksgiving. So um, I was wondering why everybody was so ungrateful during, no, I'm joking, Um, Thanksgiving. So I want to wish everybody Thanksgiving. I know it's a time of family, a time of fun, a time of fellowship. I know we're looking forward to uh, our children or two of our children being back and um, and. So it's interesting. I have a question. How many of you guys like being around grateful people or thankful people? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So, you know, there's a second question coming, right? How many of you guys like being around people that are ungrateful and never satisfied and there's never enough of this and there's never enough of that and people aren't nice enough and the service isn't good enough and the food's cold and my feet hurt? How many of you guys like being around people like that? All right. Some of you guys like being around people like that. Because you say, I got to like myself. I got to like myself. Okay. <laughs> Some of you are wondering, so when's the trick question coming in? You know, what, what's so bad about that? So, so we all kind of like in agreement that we all like being around people that are grateful. And we've been talking a lot about lordship in our lives and and focusing in on everything stemming from our relationship with God. And we, we talked about the other side of the coin of our oikos and really being an agent of change, of changing people's worlds by bringing Christ into their lives. Because we believe that there are 8 to 15 people, you know, that God has put in our lives where he's put us supernaturally and strategically in their lives to help them to know Christ in a deeper way. And many of you, when this idea is, is, has been introduced, and really it's, it's a biblical idea that, that is just, there's a name to it now, right? Um, have been, been kind of enlightened and see things in a different way. And this Thanksgiving, I didn't want this to just be a Thanksgiving lesson because I believe that we, we, we have two purposes for coming together on Sunday morning. I mean, the, the first one, we come together to celebrate the Lord's communion, to celebrate the Lord's supper, to honor him and to recognize him. And hopefully we do that every day. Okay, we don't wait. Okay, Sunday time to, you know, put on my church clothes and put on my church thing or whatever. Hopefully we're doing that every day that we're honoring God and honoring the the sacrifice of Jesus uh, for our lives and his resurrection. But I believe another part, again, two sides of the same coin is to be equipped, to be better equipped, to be that agent of change, to be the church, to be that person, to help others to know Christ, to help our oikos to know Christ. And and I thought about it and I said, you know, this We all agree we like being around grateful people. And so we want to be that person that people like to be around. Right? Not the one that only two or three people like to be around. Okay? We want to be grateful in all the things that, uh, in, in every situation and in all things. And so this morning is an effort to help prepare us, not saying that you're not grateful, okay? I'm not saying that because, again, sometimes we can, when, when we talk about something, you say, well, does that mean I'm not being grateful? Not saying that, okay? But can we all stand to be more grateful? Yes. Can we all learn to be more grateful for the things in our lives? Yes. And so basically it's bringing gratitude to your oikos by counting your blessings, counting your blessings. And so if we were to count them, I'm sure it would be in the thousands. So we're not going to do that because we only got about half an hour. So we're going to count to 10. All right. And so I want us to turn to Second Peter, chapter one, verse three. Turn with me there to Second Peter, chapter one, verse three. 
And some of this is inspired uh, from a lesson that Dale did while we were gone on our retreat because he talked about the things that unite us. And really, I believe that the things that unite us in Christ are the same things that we should be the most grateful for in Christ. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Now, what's so intense about this passage of scripture, and it goes on to say to add to your faith, to add to your love, to add, to add, to add. And amen, we need to do all those things. But we're not adding to something that's not there. We're adding to something that is already there. And where did it come from? It came from God. His divine power has given us everything we need For godly life. That means no matter what circumstance we go through. If we're in Christ. We have what we need. And I want you to look at this picture. Okay. I got this from Lester's truck. Okay. That is one awesome Swiss Army knife. Because if you can't get it open, you can beat the guy over the head if he's assailing you, right? But that's, if I pronounce it right, it's the Wagner or Wenger 16999 or 999. And it's a Swiss Army knife and it's giant, right? But you could go out and basically build a house with that thing pretty much, right? It's what it, it's it's you have everything you need and, and, and it has it has a, a compass. It has a magnifying glass, has a nail clipper. It has a knife. It has an Allen wrench pliers. It's got this thing. It's got that thing. All right. It's got lots of things on it, stuff that you don't even know that you need. Right. But what's awesome is you would feel very prepared to do something with that in your pocket. OK. The thing is, we have everything that we need for a godly life. Our Swiss Army knife would look about a billion times better than that because there's a billion things that come at us every day. And yet, no matter what comes our way, temptation, sin, discouragement, whatever, we are equipped and we have what we need to live a godly life. And I want us to look at three things that we have in our toolbox, so to speak, that if we can really understand what we have, how grateful we will be. Number one is God's love. And there's a passage of scripture in 1 John that really encompasses so much about God's love. In verse uh, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now think about if we just meditate on that, that God loves you. You know, this time of year is not easy for everybody. And it's not easy for everybody because they might not feel love. Some people go through this time alone and they feel like no one loves them or no one cares for them or or no one wants to be around them. Or they've lost loved ones, they've lost relatives or they're just going through a hard time. But what would it be like if you were convinced fully of God's love for you and God's love for them? Now, just think about if that just fills our mind, God's love. How grateful would we be? How grateful are we that God loves? And it's not a love that says you move first, then I'll move. He initiated. He loved us before we loved him. It's a relentless love. It's a pursuing love. It's an unconditional love. 
that should motivate us and inspire us to be like, man, this is awesome. And if there's nothing else, I'm grateful for God's love. But not only is there love, but then there's grace. And I'm going to talk about grace and mercy together because a lot of times we look at grace and mercy as synonymous, but they're different. Grace, simply put, is getting what we don't deserve. Okay, it's favor. And God has given us, number one, is love. We don't even deserve that, nor could we ever deserve that. But he gives us salvation. He gives us Jesus. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us all this stuff. He gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. If we just took three days of our lives and said, okay, God, based on three days, these three days. These are the best three days that I could have lived in my life. We still would deserve death. We still would deserve to not be in his presence because there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. And so through his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve and his mercy. He doesn't give us what we do deserve. I mean, those three things alone should make us the, the most grateful people on the face of the planet. But we have to live in that. And I know for myself, you know, when we talked about that, that, that glass, you know, that life is your glass or, or the glass is your life. And, and I know if you can relate with me, there's sometimes we're not even grateful for the glass. Much, much less what's in it. But if we can understand that in our flaws, I I, I would look at my glass as, you know, cracked and chipping and everything like that. But God still loves me. He loves me so much. He gave me a new glass and filled it with Jesus and filled it with the spirit. But those three things alone are so much enough for us to face so many things in our lives. You know, I want to mention a couple of three people that that we need to be praying for. Diane, Renville and Carl. Carl sent me a text. He made it to Hamilton, Canada, somewhere. I'm not sure about all the geography of Canada, but um, he's going to be able to see a doctor tomorrow. And those of you that don't know his story, he couldn't get seen by a doctor here because of his Canadian citizenship and his insurance and all that stuff. So praise God, he's able to go see a doctor and prayerfully he'll get on a regiment to deal with his cancer. But we need to be praying for Diane because she's dealing with her her own health issues, dealing with her lung in Renville with uh, issues with his back. So let's be praying for them. Let's be praying for all three of them. You might say, well, I've got something. I've got something. We all got something. But those are the three that I know about. Okay. Uh, if you got something and you want to be uh, mentioned in prayer, just let us know and we'll make sure that we pray for you as well. Because you can never have too many people praying for you. Amen. But love, grace and mercy. God has given us everything we need for godly life. Next. Ephesians chapter one, verse three. This is the one that was uh, I was inspired by uh, Dale's lesson. It says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And it goes on to say in verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Verse 13, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. Now you think about it. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. In heavenly realms. Now, what are some things and I just want to do some participation. What are some things? What are some blessings, some some spiritual blessings in heavenly realms that we have in Christ? Friends. Family. Your health. George is the only one that has a list. Amen, George. I, I appreciate it. You beat Crystal this time. You go, boy. <laughs> Eternal promises. Security. Security. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Forgiveness. Peace. Strength. 
God's power? Angels. Eternal life. Fruits of the Spirit. Joy. Say it again. Work to do. Passion. Well, let me say it again. Passion! <laughs> Citizenship in His kingdom. His kingdom, right? Just His kingdom alone. A roof over our head. There are, we can go on for an hour, but we're not. But we can go on and on of the blessings. But let me ask you this. How often do we do that? How often do we just sit down and say, man, okay, what are all the spiritual blessings? And just start listing them off. Now, I'm not going to give you an assignment to do it. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't, don't. But I guarantee you that those people that have them at the forefront of their mind, all the blessings that they have are more grateful than people that don't. The people that have to search, what are my spiritual blessings? I don't even know what they are. I would say, dare say, nine times out of ten, that person might struggle with gratitude. But the people that walk around saying, it is obvious what my blessings are. I'm saved. And, and here are three. Because we're counting, right? I mean, this is a whole list of them. And a, a lot of them you, you guys said. I love the one that says hope, unity, faith. I mean, all this stuff. But I want to talk about forgiveness, redemption, and the Holy Spirit. Just briefly. Forgiveness. I mean, we can't say enough about forgiveness because forgiveness is what gives us hope. Forgiveness is the thing that God gives to us that, man, it, it really seals the deal. Because if Jesus came to just show us that we are not worthy to be saved, but did not give us a means to be saved, did not give us forgiveness, that would just be cruel. But he gave us forgiveness. And it came at the price of of his own life, the spilling of his own blood. He bought us forgiveness. And then redemption, a life for a life. We were sold as slaves to sin. And Jesus says, no, that's not good enough for my children, my brothers, my sisters. I'm going to give my life for their life. I'm going to redeem them and give them new life. Many of us can remember, not, maybe for some of us, it's not so long ago, what our old lives were like. What we were like walking around in darkness. What we were like walking around as, as, as sinners sold into slavery to sin. Wanting to quit, wanting to stop, wanting to repent, but not knowing how. And then God redeemed us. And then not only did he redeem us, he says, I'm going to give you the power to live the Christian life. I'm going to give you my spirit. He says, I'm not just going to walk with you. I'm going to be in you because I it's not enough for me to be next to you. I want to be in you and I want you in me. So here's my spirit as a seal, as a guarantee for the life that is to come with Christ forever. Those three more, three more things that if we can grasp How awesome would it be to be around you if you walk around not guilty, not sold into slavery to sin and not walking in your own power, but walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? People are going to want to be around you. People are going to be like, man, you got a different spirit about you. Think about this, guys. What are people walking around doing right now? They're plotting out their courses for Black Friday. You're like, we'll order out and just go because just go, stores open at five. We usually eat dinner at five, but we're going to go shopping. We're going to go to In-N-Out and have a turkey burger. They don't, they don't have turkey burgers, but, you know, I don't know. Because the world, and okay, now let me just say this. If you had plans to go shopping on Black Friday, I am not condemning you. If you were going to go to In-N-Out and have a regular burger, I'm not condemning you. It's just an example. Just an example. Because God gave us forgiveness for your sin. Okay, no, no, no. Just joking, just joking. So, the world is out there looking. They're, They're like, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. When really it's I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. We've got to be different. 
I'm not saying we, we, we can't want these things, but I'm saying our lives should not depend, our joy should not depend, our peace should not depend on all these things. Because they're sealed with those things that are heavenly and in Christ. First Timothy chapter 6, speaking of things, let's turn, let's turn to here. First Timothy chapter 6 says, I'll give you a couple of seconds to get there. All right. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we could take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Now, this is not a passage that consumer, uh, consumers want to hear. It's not a passage that advertisers want to hear. They're like food and clothing and that will be and we'll be content with that. No, we want to create a dissatisfaction with your status in life so that you want more and you're discontent and you think our product will make you content. But that's what Satan does. He's saying it's not enough for your basic needs to be met. What Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 33 talks about seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness and saying, hey, I know God knows that we have need for food and shelter and clothing and drink and all these things. He knows these things. He's willing to give you these things. He just wants you to seek him. But I love this passage because this is something I wrestle with for probably a year, if not longer, when I was in Tallahassee working as a teacher, I was very discontent. Very, we got paid once a month and I'd get that check and, and everybody seemed to take a piece of it. I'm like, what does the ambulance service have to do with my paycheck? And I was dissatisfied. I was not content. And I, I would every Saturday I'd get with my friend and we'd talk and, and I would just bellyache to him. And he's like, well, you know, contentment, you know, we got to be content, <laughs> you know. <laughs> got to pray, brother. God knows what he's doing. Got to get close to God. Da, 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 da. We talk and. And I kid you not, I finally got it. I, I finally understood it because it finally snapped. I'm like, God, until I learn contentment, I'm not going to I'm not going to have a chance to learn anything else. Till I learned contentment. And just because I learned it, my check didn't get bigger. I dare say it might have gotten smaller, but I was content. But it was interesting because when I finally reached that point to where it's like, okay, God, I surrender, man. Food and shelter or food and clothing, that's enough. Because I realize there's nowhere in your word that you promise even shelter. Much less a car. And trust me, we're not suffering from a lack of food and we're not suffering from a lack of clothing. We're suffering from too much food and too many clothes. That's why Jimmy can say, hey, bring the clothes that you don't want. But anyway, that wasn't part of my point. My point was when I learned contentment, I kid you not, it was a short time after that. We got the call to possibly come out to Vegas. I was like, just got content. And God's like, now you're ready. I'm like, but I just got content. And now you're ready. And we wound up coming out and, you know, the rest is history. But this was a lesson that I, I had to learn. It was a hard, it took me probably over a year. So I went, I went around for a year knowing that I was not content. And knowing that I needed to get content with what I had. It's not that God gave me more. He says, be happy with what you have. Was I a fun person to be around? Not on Saturdays. But my friend stuck it out. This was the, I was the opposite of this. Even the baby is like, oh, that's cute. Okay. <laughs> that cat looks content. And what do you want to do? When you see a cat like that, what do you want to go do? 
You want to go pet it, disturb its contentment, right? You're like, hey, (laughs) that cat doesn't need you. That cat doesn't need food. That cat is content. Honestly, when I look in the scriptures, food and clothing, that's the way we're supposed to look. That's not the way I looked. I'd like to think I look like that now, but he has a lot more hair than I do. But (laughs) the bottom line thing is, we're attracted to that. What is it? Our natural compulsion is to go to it and just, because we like that. Maybe it will rub off on us, right? Maybe we'll catch something that, that he has. But it's like that in the world, too. When you're content and you're satisfied and you're happy, and you're joyful, you're a natural magnet to your oikos. When we're dissatisfied and disgruntled, we're, we are a, a repugnant smell, a repulsive thing, because the first thing they think about is like, I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. Man, you complain a lot about what you don't have. And if someone let's say that doesn't have a relationship with Christ is challenging you on your gratitude. Something's wrong. We should walk around like, well, not quite with our eyes closed, but you know, we should be, (laughs) should be content. You guys get my point, but here's the point. Here's the other thing. Someone mentioned family. It's interesting because Paul wrote those other two passages. Uh, Paul wrote one of those passages of scripture. Peter wrote the other one. And they often traveled with other people. Think about traveling with Paul who wrote this. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And you're like, man, Paul, that's a challenge because we go through a lot of stuff. But he had a family. He had people. He had friends that he traveled with. And that was their conviction. And when you surround yourself with people with that conviction, all of a sudden that contentment bug starts to spread. But we have family, and we're grateful for the family that we have in Christ. Eternal life. See, this is what it says. It says, we brought nothing into this world, into the world, and we could take nothing out of it. That implies we're going somewhere. And for those of us in Christ, we have eternal life waiting for us. Basic needs and much more. We already talked about that. We have so much more than what we need. And we've got to make sure that we go around grateful. And the 10th thing, can anyone guess what the 10th thing we should be grateful for? Not necessarily in order of importance. Man, you guys must have read my notes. <laughs> this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus. All the things we read, all of, all of it comes down to Jesus. And I know it's cliche, you know, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. But we have to ask ourselves, is he? Because if he is, then we should be the most grateful people on the face of the planet. Because he has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. He's given us every blessing in Christ in heavenly realms, every spiritual blessing. And he's given us the basic needs of life. Church, the thing I want to really encourage us to be to our oikos is to be a picture of gratitude. A picture of gratitude for the one who has given us everything, and that's Jesus Christ. So we take communion this morning, the last communion before Thanksgiving. I pray that this Thanksgiving, again, I don't know what your attitude was going into it, but I pray that if our attitude was anything but gratitude, anything but thanksgiving, anything but joy, anything but contentment, that we can be content and full of joy, that we can be a magnet to people in our oikos, and that we could be a light in this dark world. Guys, think about what we have and think about what people in California dealing with the fires people dealing with shootings, people dealing with craziness just in this world. And yet we sit content, safe, happy, supplied, everything. I pray that we can be a picture of gratitude this year to our oikos. Let's go to God in a word of prayer as we take communion together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. Everything we talked about really stems from Jesus Christ. 
As we take communion this morning, I pray that we do so with extreme gratitude in our hearts for the love that you have shown to us, for your mercy, for the grace in our lives, for the redemption, Father, that you give to us, for the forgiveness of sin, Lord, for the eternal life that you give us, for the Holy Spirit, Lord, for the family you've brought us into through Christ and through just our basic needs being met on a daily basis. Father, we glorify you, we magnify you, and we pray to our oikos that we can be a picture of gratitude. Because God, you deserve it. You are worthy. And we love you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.